In D&D, there is a feat called Fey Touch that gives you the ability to cast the Misty Step spell along with one first level spell from the Divination or Enchantment Schools of Magic. You can cast each one of these once for free with the feat, and then you can spend spell slots at the same level to cast them again. In this video, we'll be going over the best spells you can choose for your first level spell which you can take with the Fey Touched feat. Starting off at number 10, we have the spell Sleep. Sleep is a spell that has you choose a location to place a 20 foot radius sphere and then roll a 5d8. You put that much HP worth of creatures to sleep, start with the creatures with the lowest HP, then working your way up, for example. You target an area that has three goblins, one goblin gang member, and one goblin boss. On the 5d8, you get an average roll of 23. This would mean that the three normal goblins fall asleep, that uses 21 of the 23 HP you can put to sleep. However, the last two is lost as the goblin gang member has 10 HP and the remaining 2 HP worth of sleep is not enough to knock him out. Alternatively, you may want to put the goblin boss to sleep as he only has 21 health. However, this isn't how the spell works. It starts with the lowest HP creatures in the area, which in this case is the three goblins, and then works its way up. The creatures will wake up after either one minute of being asleep, upon taking damage, or after another creature spends an action to shake them awake. Now on the surface, sleep may not seem like a very strong option. If you're going up against a big boss monster with tons of health, or really anything with more HP than you can put to sleep, and in such cases the spell won't do anything, you'll just be out of a spell slot, but that's not where sleep really shines. When it gets to the most use is when you're up against a bunch of low health mobs, sleep is powerful enough to completely take multiple things out of the fight. In one of my campaigns, the players were against a large pack of wolves led by a direwolf, and they were using pack tactics to rip through the party, who were still low level at the time. However, when it got to a Redemption Paladin's turn, he cast sleep and immediately, three of the eight wolves they were up against were completely out of the fight, preventing three pack tactic users from assisting in the entire rest of the combat for the cost of a single first level spell slot. This allowed the party to safely focus on the other wolves and then execute the sleeping wolves afterwards, making the encounter much more manageable. Even outside of situations like this, sleep does have other uses. For one, this spell still essentially does an average of 23 damage, as that it's taking a creature with a number of hit points out of combat. And 23 is much more than a lot of first or second level spells can manage, and if nothing else, it at least allows you to also know if someone has more or less than a specific amount of health, if you use this on a single target. Second, it's a good non-lethal way to stop somebody from attacking you if you want to keep them alive to interrogate them, or maybe you think they're being manipulated or mind controlled and you don't want to hurt them. Sleep is just generally a really useful spell to have for this ability to completely shut down multiple low health enemies, or non-lethally deal with someone who you've managed to whittle down. But the spell does fall off a cliff at higher levels, as enemies have more and more health, so it is one of the best spells out there for levels 1 to 3, it's okay at levels 4 to 6, and it becomes almost worthless beyond level 7, which is why it only takes a number 10 spot on this list. And at number 9, we have Comprehend Languages. This is a divination spell that lets you understand the meaning of any language you see or hear, but doesn't give you the ability to actually speak those languages. It also does not help you pick up on the nuances the speakers of the language might be using, such as in language sayings and idioms like beating a dead horse or break a leg. To the speaker, it may be a nice thing to say, but to an onlooker with comprehend languages, they may consider those to be vicious insults. This happens because the spell directly translates the spoken phrase. It does not give meaning, just straight translation, kind of like magical Google Translate. So you should pray that your target is not speaking sarcastically, or if you're a DM watching this, Maybe you could set up some interesting story hooks with this. Want to know what those two goblin guards or spine owners are saying to each other but don't speak a goblin natively? Comprehend languages. Found an old musty tome in a dungeon and want to know what it says? Comprehend languages. Walked into a room and set up a trap and now some ancient voice is talking to you in a long dead language? Well look at that, it's comprehend languages time. But therein lies the problem. You see, there's no guarantee you'll actually run into one of these situations or even any situation where comprehend languages might actually be useful to you. In fact, your DM might purposely avoid giving the PCs things in languages they don't understand, so as to make sure they're not missing out on anything lore-wise. So the spell is only really as good as the DM allows it to be, and because there's no guarantee that your DM will use it like this, it only takes a number 9 spot on this list. Next up, at number 8, we have Speak with Animals. Speak with Animals is a divination spell that lets you, you guessed it, speak with animals. Now, this is a rank above Comprehend Languages because you're almost always going to be able to find an animal or some sort, or at least you are more likely to find an animal than you are a language you don't know. If you're in a forest, obviously there will be animals all around you, but even in dungeons, you'll generally be able to find a rat or a spider or something to converse with, and in cities, you can probably talk with pet cats and dogs and maybe carrier pigeons if you're in a setting where that type of communication is common. Now, why is Speak With Animals so good, you may ask? Well, simply put, animals are great for learning about the local area. The spell even goes out of its way to say that, while limited by their intelligence, the animal should be able to at minimum 
give you information about nearby locations and monsters, and anything you've seen or heard in the last day. So a real quick image, if you will, that you're trying to track down a cave of goblins, but the cave is in the middle of some very thick woods, and you've gotten a bit lost because the DM asked for survival checks and you all failed. Well, you can quickly cast Speak with Animals and ask a nearby woodpecker for directions towards this cave. Alternatively, imagine you're trying to track down a missing person and you've tracked them to a house, but you've hit a dead end. Suddenly, you notice a rat scurrying through the area. Well, now you can talk to the rat and find out if the rat has seen anything. There are loads of things speaking to animals can help you learn things, which makes this spell a very useful tool. Even so, while your DM is more likely to allow you to speak with animals to get information over something like Comprehend Languages, some DMs may have you only ever find animals who are hostile to you, or too scared to talk to you, thus making the spell useless, which is why it still takes a lower spot on this list. In number 7, we have Hex and Hunter's Mark, since they both essentially do the same thing, just for different classes. What they do is, in exchange for a bonus action and your concentration, they let you add an extra d6 damage. For Hunter's Mark, the d6 is of the same type as your weapon, so a magical longbow would deal piercing damage, while a normal longsword would deal non-magical slashing damage. For Hex, the damage is simply necrotic damage, but this also means that it procs on both spells and weapon attacks unlike Hunter's Mark. And while a spell slot for a 1d6 extra damage on a future attack against a target seems kind of meh, it is made much better by the fact that if the creature as Hexed or Hunter's Mark drops to zero hit points, you can transfer the spell's effect to a creature as a bonus action, so it's essentially a never-ending boost so long as you keep your concentration. Both spells do have similar other small niches too. Hex lets you choose an ability score, strength, dexterity, constitution, etc, etc, and the creature has disadvantage on ability checks made with that ability. This could be a lot of help if you have a grappler in the party to give the grapple targets disadvantage to get free. But more than that, there are a few spells that require ability checks, probably the most important counter spell, which when used against a spell higher than third level requires an ability check to succeed. If you keep a mage disadvantaged with their spellcast ability modifier, it could hurt them pretty significantly. Hunter's Mark is a bit more simple, as it gives you advantage on perception survival checks to find the marked creature. While this doesn't really affect a combat, as using an ability check during a fight would require an action, but if a creature is using the hide action, it could theoretically come up, though I've never seen it happen. However, think back to our previous example about looking for a cave full of goblins. If you were able to mark one of the goblins, then you might not have failed the survival check, meaning you wouldn't have to ask some animals about where they are, so you can just go straight there. Still, that's basically all the spells do, and that's a bit of a problem. As you see, the extra damage on Hex and Hunter's Mark seems great on surface, but the more you look into it, the more cracks start to show. First off, the fact the spell does extra damage after you've already hit something means that you actually need to hit to have the spell do anything, which means mathematically, the spell works out to be dealing less than 1d6 damage every turn, as you won't always hit, meaning the damage won't always go off. But more than that, the real problem with this spell is that it takes your concentration, which means that if you're a caster of some sort, you can't use your concentration on other spells that would probably do more damage, or even hold a spell to cast so long as you're concentrating on this. And if you're a barbarian, you can't actually maintain concentration on this spell while raging. But of course, not every class is a caster or a barbarian, and these spells are actually super useful on their other martial classes that aren't using their concentration for anything else anyway, and aren't using their bonus action all that often. However, something important to note is that these spells proc on each hit with no limited number of procs per turn, and because of this, a Hex has become a staple for the Warlock alongside Eldritch Blast. Hex can be used to devastating effect, as unlike other cantrips, which just increase their damage when you level up, Eldritch Blast increases the number of times it hits instead. As the Warlock has very few spell slots to begin with, they are usually not as worried about concentration as other casters, making this a spell perfect for them. Still, as the Fate Touch feat only allows you to cast a spell you pick once per long rest, it would be ill-advised to pick this up as a Warlock, as you should instead simply be taking this while leveling up. Class-based tangent aside, this video is about the best spells overall, not the top 10 worst spells to pick up with the Fate Touch feat part 4 Warlocks. We aren't that desperate for video ideas quite yet. Thanks in part to all the ideas you lovely people leave down in the comments. Moving on to number 6, we have Tasha's Hideous Laughter. This is a spell that causes a creature of your choice to find everything hilariously funny and causes them to start rolling on the floor laughing, causing the prone condition and also prevents the target from standing up. However, the really strong part of the spell is that it incapacitates the target, meaning they can't take any actions or reactions. So all the target affected by the spell can do is crawl around the floor prone, use a free action to interact with an object, and then at the end of their turns, it can retry the wisdom save that causes them to be affected by the spell. So whatever you use this on essentially becomes completely useless and is removed from the fight, so long as they keep failing their saves. 
This spell affects its target only on a failed wisdom saving throw, and the target does get to retry the save at the end of each of its turns, as well as whenever the creature is damaged. And if the save is triggered by damage, the save is made with advantage. So be careful when you aim your AoE spells. If it manages to succeed even once, the spell ends. That said, Wisdom is one of the better saves you can force a creature to make, as most creatures in the Monster Manual don't have a very high Wisdom, but it's not as good as forcing something like an Intelligence save. This leads us to the downside of the spell. You see, to even affect a creature, Tasha's Hideous Laughter needs to be used on something with an Intelligence score of 5 or higher, as any creature with an Intelligence score of 4 or lower simply isn't affected by the spell. This means that you can't use this on most beast-type creatures at all, as well as a fair few monsters. Additionally, like Hex and Hunter's Mark from the previous spot, this spell takes up your concentration, which causes us to run into the same issues as it did there. But even so, the potential to completely take one creature out of the fight for at least one turn, as the second save happens at the end of the turn, is enough to bring this up to the number 6 spot on this list. And at number 5, we have Dissonant Whispers. This is a spell that forces a creature of your choice to make a wisdom saving throw, and if it fails, it takes 3d6 psychic damage, and then the creature must use its reaction to move as far away from you as possible, with the creature taking half damage and not needing to move away if it succeeds the save. Now, while this spell does do some solid damage, dealing about the same damage as a great sword attack from a character with an average strength modifier, where the spell really shines is in its ability to force your opponent to use the reaction to run away. You see, by forcing your opponent to run away, you get to essentially decide to have your enemies provoke attacks of opportunity from you and all of your other melee fighters, or get dangerous melee enemies safely out of range of you and your allies if you're a ranged character, where you can then safely continue to pepper them with attacks from a distance. Obviously, if you're a ranged character with melee abilities, you get to do both, while also preventing the enemy from using their reaction to do stuff, like make attacks of opportunity of their own. Dissonant Whispers is just an all-around solid spell that used to be limited by your ability to get it as only bards and one warlock subclass used to have access to it. But with Tasha's Cold of Everything, another subclass got access to it, and of course, as is the point of this list, you can take it through the Fae Touched Feet now. That said, as good as Dissonant Whispers is at supporting your party by forcing your opponent to flee, there is another spell that can do a similar thing in a better way. And on that point, at number 4, we have Command. This is a spell that lets you issue a one-word command, and if the creature issued the command to fails a wisdom saving throw, they need to spend their next turn doing whatever command was given to them. The spell even gives examples of some potential commands you might use, with one of them being the command to flee, which essentially does the same thing as Dissonant Whispers. But unlike Dissonant Whispers, which only uses the target's reaction, using command flee forces your opponent to spend its entire turn doing whatever it can to basket it away from you while still provoking attacks of opportunity, and that's only one use of command. It also has a potential effect of Grovel, which causes the target to fall prone and then end its turn. Similar to how Tasha's Hideous Laughter could cause the target to fall prone and lose a turn, but without requiring your concentration to do so. Command just has a whole bunch of versatility, and is only really limited by your imagination, and limitations imposed by your DM, of course. For instance, you may be able to issue the command Surrender, which will cause the target to spend its turn surrendering, possibly sowing confusion in the battle before the target snaps back to their senses. Or maybe the command Confess to get somebody to tell their secrets. Even with all this useful dis command does have a few limitations to how it can be used, aside from your imagination. The spells cannot be used on a target that doesn't understand you, nor can it be used to issue a command that's directly harmful to the creature you're using it on. For instance, you can't command a target to drink after setting a vile poison in front of them, nor can you command them to walk if they are in front of a cliff. If it can be considered directly harmful to the target, command will not work. Even so, for its sheer versatility, command takes the number 4 spot on this list. And entering the top spots now, at number 3 we have Detect Magic. This is a spell that lets you sense the presence of magic within 30 feet of you. Now, why is this useful? Well, simply put, because magic is often behind the weird stuff that happens to you in D&D. If you come across a town and it's completely abandoned, but fires are still lit and food is still laid out on tables, Detect Magic is going to be the spell you use to find out if there's magical mist rolling through the town, transporting people to a different plane, or that cult meeting under the tavern has unleashed a magical ritual, wiping everybody out. If you're in a dungeon and you come across an old ring sitting alone in a room, Detect Magic is a spell that can tell you safely if the ring is radiating any magic or not, as well as warn you about the magical trap that would have triggered had you just picked it up. It's also great for finding things or people that are hidden behind an illusion of some sort, such as hidden rooms, magical doors, or detecting that a door that you're about to enter is actually a portal to a different plane. Detect magic is really good as a pseudo danger sense, or as a way to figure out what's going on around you without needing to actually touch anything with an ungloot hand, and is incredibly versatile in what it can do given how many different magical effects you may encounter on an average adventure. 
If something seems weird or out of place, Detect Magic is usually the spell that can figure out exactly what's wrong and help you figure out what to do about it. And it's just a really useful utility spell to have. And obviously, one party member with the Detect Magic can help the whole party out in trouble. So, for its ability to act as a protective measure and for giving you a better sense about what is happening around you, Detect Magic ticks number three spot on this list. And at number two, we have Bless. This is a buff spell that lets you choose up to three creatures in range and give them an extra d4 in all of their attack rolls and saving throws for one minute. This means that Bless provides both an offense and a defensive buff to three separate people, and while d4 doesn't seem like much on the surface, the increased chance to hit bonus alone is very strong. Even if you only roll a 1 on your d4, that's still the same amount that you would get if you buffed your attack stat with an entire ability score improvement, or if you had a plus 1 weapon. A higher chance to hit means more hits statistically, which means you'll be dealing more damage too, as any attack you miss is attack where you're missing out on damage. This buff at low levels can be almost as good as having an extra attack, and this is only factoring the attack bonus part of the spell, and only for a single person. Remember that Bless increases the accuracy of three separate creatures, which would be almost three extra attacks, and this is all still before we get to the better saving throws. Speaking of, the saving throw buff of Bless is even better than the attack roll buff as it's really hard to increase your saving throws, aside from items like Cloak and Ring of Protection, only increasing your saving throws by plus one. But that is the minimum bonus to saves that you get from Bless, as they can go all the way up to a plus four if you roll well. And as to why one of these items is rare while the other one is only of uncommon quality, most people agree that it's a holdover from previous editions of the game where rings were harder to find than cloaks, and you can wear multiple rings while you can only realistically wear one cloak. Getting back on track, the point is that having this saving throw bonus is really good. Say you are in the line of fire of a dragon's breath weapon. Bless could mean the difference between life and death. There are also a lot of save or suck spells that can down you or your party members immediately, so having Bless up could be the difference between life and death. Even a seemingly small boost such as a 1d4 can actually save a life. Bless is also super useful for helping an ally maintain concentration, or succeeding on their saves that could be the difference between a DC 10 concentration check or a DC 20. If, for example, they would be hit by a Dragon's Breath for 40 damage, but succeed thanks to Bless, that becomes only 20 damage. Bless, in of itself, accounts from anywhere from 10 to 40% of the requirement to maintain concentration on the baseline DC 10 concentration save. This makes it low-key one of the best buff spells in the game. And for how low level it is, this is a great pickup as it can still be used effectively even in tier 4 levels of play, especially if you have nothing else to concentrate on. All that to say, Bless easily takes the number 2 spot on this list. And lastly, at the top spot, number one is Silvery Barbs. This is a spell that was released rather recently in the book Strixhaven, A Curriculum of Chaos. The effect of Silvery Barbs is that, as a reaction, you can force a creature who has succeeded on an attack roll, ability check, or saving throw within 60 feet of you to re-roll the roll, forcing them to use a lower result. And then it goes on to have an additional effect, which grants you or a creature of your choice in range advantage on their next attack roll, ability check, or saving throw they make within one minute. So, what makes Silvery Barbs so good? Well, because of the sheer number of applications it has. Has a creature succeeded its save against your big spell that would completely take them out of the fight? Has a creature just crit against you and is about to deal damage that will kill you? Has a creature succeeded something under disadvantage and you really feel they shouldn't have? Well, for the remarkably low price of only reaction that you probably don't have a use for anyway, and a single first level spell slot, you can force them to re-roll while also simultaneously buffing either yourself or another creature to make sure your side succeeds at something. Not only can Silvery Bars protect you and your friends from harm by forcing somebody to reroll an attack that hit you or an ally, but it can also be used offensively to turn your enemy's successful saving throws into potentially failed ones. Moreover, it's incredibly useful when you understand the concept of action economy, as it lets you do more with your turn. See, in D&D, generally the side that can take more actions will be the side that wins a battle, outside of huge gaps in power. Now, remember how good Bless was for only adding a d4 to your action? Well, Silvery Barbs allows you to give advantage to a creature, which will be better than a d4 most of the time. Debuffs another creature, and more importantly, Silvery Barbs only takes your reaction, which means you still have your normal turn to do whatever you want. In other words, you are doing more actions in a round of combat, which means you're much more likely to win due to the aforementioned action economy. So for being able to do some truly impressive stuff as a reaction, Silvery Barbs takes the number one spot on this list, and is sometimes banned at tables for being too good. Alright, and that's the list. Do you think I missed any better spells that would be really good pick with a Fey Touch feat? If so, I'd love to hear about them down in the comments, along with future ideas for videos just like this one. 